She wasn't just a rich lady, a rich socialite woman in Denver. She was so much more than that. And she wasn't just the survivor of Titanic. She was so much more than that. Sometimes we laugh here as, as docents, we say, Titanic brings them here, and then we get to tell them the rest. Because if you ask a tour, what's the one thing you know about Martyr Rent? Whether they're kids, whether they're adults, whether they're tourists from around the world, that's what they say. And then we get to tell the rest of the story. She was born in Hannibal, Missouri in 1867. Uh, John and Johanna Tobin had a total of six children, so she's first generation Irish. And at least for me, that's an important thing. I, people say Irish American, I say American Irish. Um, with any nationality who comes over here, the first generation certainly view their lives differently than they would have in their country of origin. And I think you see that over and over again, but particularly with the Irish. So she was a very poor girl, there's no question. Her father worked for the Hannibal Gas Works, he was a day laborer. They had very little money, but they found enough money to educate all their children to an eighth grade level that they included their daughters, speaks volumes. Uh, Margaret would have been thrilled to go to first grade and learn basic numbers and letters, and then home to help her mother. It was labor intensive to run a household. So Johanna Tobin, thank you, two sacrifices from you. Uh, but that gives you again a good idea of the environment in which she was raised. So when she came here to Colorado looking for a rich husband, she wanted to take care of her parents. And there were certainly many opportunities for women to work, but there weren't many opportunities for them to make a fortune. And she met James Joseph Brown, who was a poor man, and she married for love. The silver crash in 1893, uh, when everything was, of course, throughout the entire country, was in dire straits. J.J. had studied mining engineering on his own, and he came up with a rather ingenious way of holding up the sandy sides of the mine in Leadville. Every time they tried to dig to get to other ores, the walls collapsed. He uses bales of hay and timber. The walls hold, they get to a lake of gold, high-grade copper, Leadville is saved. So they gave him a seat on the board and a whole lot more stock in the Ibex Mining Company. And I guess the lesson for many, if you follow your heart, sometimes it works out. It's one thing to look at a photograph. And that, of course, brings something to you. It's another thing to stand in a house, to stand in a place. Then there are, oh, so many layers. And I think it's important not just um, for historical sense, but I think it's important for young girls, too. Uh, battles still go on. Uh, we're still fighting some of the same battles in a different way. And I think it's important for them to know more about women's history. Well, from a preservationist point of view, it's part of Denver's history. The, from an architectural point of view, it's one of the few left in the city that was designed and built by William Lang, who was a pretty um, popular domestic architect. Most of his, his buildings have been demolished, so it was to stay at home. The focus was supposed to be uh, their home, their children if they had any, and any opinion they had was whatever their husband wanted them to have. And she wasn't like that. You know, she was, she was brought up to be an independent person. Uh, she was brought up to believe that she should express her opinion. And in the Victorian era, it was not easy for a woman to do that. But she lived the courage of her conviction. She Women's names were supposed to be in the newspaper when they were born, when they married, or when they died. Her name was in the newspaper a lot more than that. And newspaper reporters uh, have two wonderful quotes. They said the words fail and no were not in her vocabulary. And they weren't. The West in particular um, brought out a lot of things. Women had a freedom here that I don't think they particularly would have had in the East. When women came West, they were working as hard as the men. They were taking the same risks as the men. They were dying mm -hmm. alongside the men. So I think women viewed themselves differently, and men to a certain extent viewed them different things. But it's important to remember that there were hundreds of women, thousands in the whole country, who were doing a lot of the same things that she was doing. And I like to think in some way her story represents all their stories. They didn't all sail on Titanic, so we don't remember them. But there's no question that she stood a cut above. Great organizational skills. Uh, today she run a corporation. She couldn't do that. Uh, 
was very politically active, even in Leadville before she came to Denver. One of the first things she did when she got here was join the Denver Women's Club. In those days, women could not run for office. So they had no way from an elected position to change the city. So they formed women's clubs and then they went out and got what they wanted in the community. So if they weren't happy with the, the trash removal or they thought children weren't being treated appropriately or Denver didn't have enough hospitals or whatever, they used the power of those women's clubs to put pressure on the officials and get some of those changes. Probably one of the things that she's most known for is working with Judge Ben Lindsay, uh, forming a juvenile court system to take care of kids who were literally running the streets of Denver who didn't have adults for whatever reason to advocate for them or take care of them. And that accomplishment is still alive today. The system they devised is the system the entire United States uses. So she she always cared for those less fortunate than she was. Vets in Colorado really had a voice because women could vote in Colorado in 1893. They couldn't vote federally until 1920, so you can imagine what it felt like to have one vote. You wanted to have more. And the progressives were women forming clubs throughout the United States, fighting primarily for education for women and children. It was still denied to so many people, it's hard to believe in this day and age. But they also did things like public bathhouses, public playgrounds. Um, the poor had no water, so they could go and bathe once a week at the bathhouse. And they felt that, I love this quote, that the poor children who were playing unsupervised might get into mischief, which I think is probably true. So they had public playgrounds, public swimming pools. They really tried to address the quality of life for the poor. I love the most about her um, that she went forward, achieved great things, but she never turned her back on her heritage. It was very easy, as you know, in this time period, when you couldn't Google, to reinvent yourself, and many people did as they made their fortunes. They had a new name, they worshipped in a new tradition, um, but she did none of those things. Her parents, who were very simple working class people, John and Johanna Tobin, lived in this house until they died. So they're here for every party, for every event, she was instrumental in raising the funds to build her church, the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception, a few blocks away, <laughs> conveniently located for her to walk to church. Um, and so at a time when it was difficult to be Irish and Catholic, uh, she stayed very true to her heritage, yet she moved forward, she achieved great things. I love that she never acted like the wealthy woman she became. I think because she grew up in a poor household, she knew the value of work. I think she never forgot what it felt like to be, to live that way, and she had such compassion for the other people, for people less fortunate than she, and you know, once she had those resources, she really could make a difference. I love that she was a so, that she had an active social life. I love that she was a fashion icon of Denver. I love all of those things about her.